All right. We are live. Um, you are correct. If you mouse over a screen, you can see the person's name. We'll give it just a minute here and see if uh, Mark can join us. And I see that people are starting to uh, uh, sign into the session. So we'll just hang on for just a minute here before we start. One of our uh, panelists is uh, still uh, technically connecting. So we'll give it like 60 seconds and then we'll get rolling. And then if he uh, joins us late, uh, he joins us as soon as he can get on, and that's fine. We'll bring him, bring him in right away if that's the case. So for Dose, you want to sing us a little song or something while we wait? That, that's a sure way to drive everybody away. <laughs> is it, is right, it maybe, uh, maybe John has a joke. A joke? No, I thought you said maybe John is a joke. No. <laughs> I said maybe I have one for us. Somebody has a joke for us. <laughs> the debate. <laughs> okay, well, the debate was its own joke, so it doesn't even need a punchline. <laughs> I, I think the best part about the debate is was it ended. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. How is Trudeau faring these days, anyways? You know, he's, he's faring okay. He's got a minority government, but he's been uh, supported by other governments in Canada. And Canada is kind of in the middle of the pack for COVID. Uh, you know, not done the best, not done the worst. So somewhere in the middle. <laughs> Has he been able to skate through that little bit of that scandal that took place with some of his? Direct reports, right, with that nonprofit organization or something like that. I like that you use the verb skate. So apparently, all Canadians skate. Is that what that was? <laughs> yeah. Well, the, the world's longest canal is uh, just outside my door. So, oh yeah, that's it's so cool. Skating rink <laughs> in the winter. Yeah, I guess we do skate right. and skate. All right, let's. I, I think we can go ahead just out of out of respect for everybody's time. Get started okay. here. Um, this is our panel on coaching, especially during COVID-19. My name is Jeff Hoffman. I'm just moderating. Um, I am the uh, a longtime uh, CEO and entrepreneur. I've uh, been a CEO of both public and private companies. I today serve as the chairman of the Global Entrepreneurship Network, uh, where we work helping companies scale, launch, scale, and grow in uh, 177 different countries. Um, so I've been on both sides of the table. Uh, a lot of years as an executive uh, that probably could use more coaching than I got. Um, uh, and then many years uh, doing a lot of coaching now. So what I'd like to do to get us started is I'm going to have each of our panelists, I'm going to let them introduce themselves. It makes a lot more sense because they'll say about themselves what they want to say. Um, so I'd like you each, uh, for those, you can start us off, take a couple minutes, tell us about Two things, a bit about your background so we understand your perspective, uh, but equally importantly, sort of your role and relationship to coaching uh, on either end of the coaching spectrum. So why don't you take a few minutes and do that first, and we'll each do an intro before we get into the actual uh, meat of the matter. Okay. Well, thanks for the introduction, Jeff. It's a pleasure to be at the RASIS conference. My name is Ferdos Karas. I was... Uh, Basically, born in India, American educated, Canadian, uh, partly with a Swiss residency. Uh, so, what I do is uh, deal with creativity more than anything else. I have uh, worked in creativity for the last 25 years after having stints in the government dealing with uh, immigration and refugee issues, and before that, having uh, headed the United Nations Association in Canada. So in creativity, what I've specialized in doing is behavior change communications. My work has been seen by over a billion people, if not two billion people, used in 198 countries. It now exists in uh, over 400 different language versions. And it's basically on the biggest social issues of the world. So currently, of course, I'm working on COVID-19, uh, both on education uh, and on behavior change. So on coaching specifically, I have been coaching on creativity and the use of creativity in today's world. And I do think that COVID-19, if it has given us any silver lining, 
it is that we have had to rethink everything. Uh, that every uh, part of our, our lives, both personal and professional, has had to be rethought. I don't think we will go completely back to where we were prior to COVID, even if there's a vaccine tomorrow, which I don't think will happen because I have worked on many diseases throughout my life, disease prevention, uh, including uh, Ebola and Zika and malaria and HIV AIDS. And I know on HIV AIDS, for example, we have been trying to find a vaccine for 30 years and there is still no vaccine on HIV. So I'm not, I, I'm not pessimistic about it, but if we do go back to, um, if we do have a vaccine, I still think that we will not immediately go back to uh, what, what, is, uh, what we could call the BC area, which is the before COVID area. So um, I, I uh, use creativity to get companies and individuals to change their thinking. And I use creativity as a transformational thought process, and we can get into that in a little bit, to, to come up with solutions to problems and to change uh, the way that they uh, approach problems and, uh, and go forward with their own personal and their professional lives. Thank you very much. Wow. <laughs> Your body of work is very, very impressive. Um, thank you so much for sharing and for being here. So uh, uh, let's see, who wants to go next? John, you want to go next? Sure. Yeah. Good evening, everyone. Uh, and uh, yeah, great to be part of, of the Heresis community again. I mean, the last two years, it was wonderful to be in Portugal and uh, walking on the front there and going to the casino in the evening for the dinner. You know, fantastic. But here we are in a a very different environment, but uh, but glad to be here. Um, so, yeah, my um, background in coaching, um, I was uh, international managing director in a, in a global corporate and I was coached, and this is 20 years ago, um, and it had such a big impact on, on me, both personally and professionally, that I thought, yeah, that would be a great thing to do for, for a living. So I, I left my corporate career and set up a coaching practice 18 years ago since that time, I've coached over 130 CEOs across 22 different countries. Um, but I've also had the privilege to work with sports um, athletes and coaches. Uh, so Olympic, Team GB Olympic sports teams and England cricket and um, Premiership football clubs. So, so I've seen a lot about coaching in those, both those different worlds. And, um, you know, I've gathered that, that sort of experience into two books. One, one book was called Challenging Coaching. Um, and another book that's second edition has just come out is The Trusted Executive. So my, my, my specialism in coaching is really about challenge and how challenge shows up in, in coaching, but also trust and uh, how leaders uh, are helped to build trust. Because I agree with Fedosa's comment that, um, you know, the, the world of work is, is going to change and is changing and was changing uh, and, and will be accelerated through that change because of this pandemic and that leaders are going to need a lot of help to adapt to this this new environment where I think trust as the currency of leadership will become increasingly important. So that's the particular sort of passion that I have um, in, in the coaching world. Excellent. Thank you very much. Ned? All right. My name is Ned Clunan, and uh, thank you for hosting this event. It's great to be with this community once again. Um, I spent over 32 years working for a Fortune 50 company. Half of that time I spent in the C-suite and working directly with the CEO. Uh, I was responsible for <clears throat> all of our business expansion activities around the world. I spent a tremendous amount of time in India, China, and Vietnam in particular. Since then, <clears throat> I am currently a partner in a angel investing firm known as Wayfair Partners, and uh, we are investors in technology companies focused primarily in the travel and hospitality sector, which is we could use some coaching probably ourselves as a result of this. Maybe a psychiatrist would be better. <laughs> uh, but, um, it's, you know, we have, you know, it's it's about a $30 million fund that we work with and we're but in 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 relation to coaching in particular i sit on a number of boards of these companies uh both advisory boards and governing boards 
and I sit on a number of boards of nonprofit organizations, some of them very large. And uh, over a period of 30 years, I've sent, spent all that time. And I have a consulting practice where mm-hmm. it's definitely it's just directed to the C-suite and working with CEOs as they try to build their tech number companies, working with CEOs as they try to build their nonprofit organizations and um, also, you know, CEOs of existing, you know, big companies and, you know, that, you know, just want assistance and want to have a better understanding about how to operate primarily in the international environment. So that's my background right now. Thank you, Ned Mark. Your timing is perfect. All we were doing is taking a couple, two, three minutes to tell us your background and your relationship slash involvement in the world of coaching. So why don't you take a few minutes? We were literally just. Yeah, unfortunately, having tech difficulties. Can you hear me? Yeah. Oh, yep. Coming through. Um, uh, Mark Grismo, I'm um, currently serving on boards of directors, bank, a couple of fintech companies, a big day to play in the wine industry. And that comes after um, over 40 years in the banking industry, of which about close to 40 of it was in the entrepreneurial ecosystem, both in California and also um, globally. Um, sitting on boards of directors, I do some consulting um, with companies, and it's usually working with the C-suite and uh, and understanding their challenges. And uh, given particularly my experience, 24 years at Silicon Valley Bank, growing a company from 100 people up to 2,500 people, 900 million in assets up to 45 billion in assets with no acquisitions. There was certainly a lot of scar tissue that, that I can share. Thank you very much. So let, let, let's start jumping into this, but I think we should start with uh, everybody's definition to make sure we're clear on what is coaching. Uh, because a, a lot of people that were sort of messaging me before this um, don't really understand what coaching, here were the three things that I heard. Um, before we get into the COVID part of coaching, just in general, I want, to, I want to address the question of what is coaching, and then we're going to talk about who needs it um, and who's open to it. But first, let's define it, because people started asking me about the differences between mentoring, coaching, and consulting, uh, because different people offer different ones of those. And a lot of people, I was surprised, said, I don't really know which is which. When are you mentoring me? When are you coaching me? When are you my consultant? Um, so... Let's do this in reverse order because this is one I would like everybody to weigh in on your definition of what coaching includes, doesn't include in the context that I just gave. So, Mark, why don't you start us off with that? Your thoughts on that. Okay. Um, I might just bring up an example of a company that I'm uh, dealing with in Brazil. It's a fintech company. And I go there and a good part of the week is what I consider consulting, meaning talking about their business strategy, what they're doing. But then every time the CEO um, takes me aside and says, I want a couple hours of your time, and it, the discussion, and I'm not sure between mentorship and coaching, but his issue is, okay, you've been through a fast growth environment. What should I be worried about? You know, how should I be dealing with the board of directors? How do I pick a board of directors? You know, things like that. And to me, that is more coaching. Um, uh, mentorship to me delves into also the more holistic personal aspects of what a person is facing with the trials at home or whatever else. So um, that's how I make the distinction. Sorry, I guess I was still muted. Ned, why don't you go next? Well, I think, uh, much has been said already that I would, you know, echo. But um, I think when the coaching aspect really evolves, more like what was just said is, you know, uh, on boards that I sit, it doesn't make any difference whether it's nonprofit or for profit either. And when you sit on the board and you have a senior position on that board, and you're working on governments issues and strat- strategy issues with the with the uh, CEO usually. You know, it's more of a strategic focus, but um, how they engage 
with the board and how they gauge with the engage with the external environment in particular to uh, is more of a coaching thing as opposed to strategy. How do you how do you meet with you know the media? How do you meet with a U.S. senator? You know, to who sits on top of the funding for your research laboratory and devise a value added presentation to them in addition to a long tail building relationship. These that's that's more the coaching part of it, I think. You know, so you start with a strategy about we need to be, let's say, getting, you know, fifty million dollar grants from an NIH, right? But we should go through the Department of Defense. And they say, well, why do we do that? And how do we do that? Well, you happen to be sitting in a state where the senator actually sits on top of the subcommittee that can pull the trigger on that kind of money. Is that kind of coaching? This is what you do. And what do you say to this person when you get there? How do you touch nerves so that this person wants to work with you and not the next person coming into the office? And you have still have credit at the bank after you finished with your issue. So that's more of the coaching side of it. All right. Your dose? Um, I thought John was next. Um, <laughs> you go. You go. <laughs> okay. Well, to me, coaching uh, is a fundamental uh, way of people uh, getting educated and changing their behavior. And uh, you're imparting your expertise uh, as a coach uh, on uh, whatever issue is before you, whether that's on a very large scale. I mean, I reach hundreds of millions of people down to company CEOs uh, where I'm trying to get them to change their behavior and their thinking uh, or using creativity. So uh, it doesn't really matter to me whether uh, we're talking about a large scale or a small scale. The principles that we apply in coaching uh, um, are difficult, uh, but they're more or less the same. Uh, and you have to understand the audience. You have to understand the uh, whether you're talking to somebody on a one-on-one -on -one basis. You have to understand the objectives uh, of the person. You have to understand what needs to change what education they need or what different strategy they need to employ or how you need to get them to change their thinking, to broaden up their thinking, to transform their thinking. And that's what I think coaching is. So coaching is an educational process uh, by which you, you give out your expertise and you help a person or hundreds of millions of people come to a different way of thinking you can't impose coaching. You can't impose it. They have to internalize the messaging that you're giving, whether it's a, on a one-to-one -one basis or hundreds of millions of people. You have to reach people in such a way that they come to their own conclusion on how to uh, go move forward or how they change their behavior or their knowledge. Thank you. Uh, John? Yeah, I, th I think I come from quite a pure school of coaching. So I would define coaching as a powerful process that unlocks the potential of individuals and teams. And so for me, coaching is not about well, content. So you, just, you just raised the price of it with your definition. Absolutely. absolutely. Like uh, <laughs> but it is for me a process. It's not about content. So if somebody, if somebody works with me as a coach, it's content free. Um, and it's about unlocking potential. So it's about the latent potential that is already there that needs to be unlocked. So it's not about me educating or me um, passing on wisdom or expertise. It's very much me about facilitating a process that allows awareness to be created in the other parties. Um, so, you know, for me, that's very different from mentoring, where mentoring to me is much more about, you know, I'm the wise owl and I'm passing on specific experiences and expertise uh, to somebody who is maybe not as far down the path of that particular competence as, as I would be. So, I, so I'm coming from, yeah, what I think is probably quite a, quite a purist definition of uh, non-directive coaching, as, 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 as I would refer to it. Okay, so let's do this. Let's just open up the floor um, and let's talk about COVID. What are executives dealing with now that they weren't before? 
uh, what kind of coaching do they need and what specific things are you guys seeing in your in your coaching world because of COVID that your executives are dealing with? And what I'd like is to make this a conversation uh, with sort of two rules. Um, nobody speak too long and everybody just kind of jump in so we get a little flow to the conversation. So whoever wants to start, uh, just start. But again, what do, you, what do we need? What's different because of COVID? And what are you seeing out there, uh, your executives needing? What are they dealing with specific to this? So whoever wants to start, let's just have a conversation. Well, let me give you a one-word answer. Everything is different. <laughs> Literally everything. I mean, if you look at it from a CEO's point of view, uh, I think that everything from the supply chain to the way they manage their own people, to the way they recruit new people, to the way they market and reach customers, everything is different. There isn't a single thing that you can simply apply the old way of thinking uh, in today's world. And as I said in my opening remarks, I'm not so sure that we go back to the way it was. And uh, take retail as an industry, for example. Uh, if, you, if you're a company in retail, and you don't have an online presence, you're pretty much going to die, I think, in the near future. So uh, if you don't already have a serious online presence as a CEO uh, and you're simply in retail, you better rethink your business model. Perhaps in some countries it'll work, like in China and India, but for the most part, uh, I think you're going to have to rethink your business model. And I can go through that uh, in, in, in company after company after company even a high-tech company like Apple uh, needs to rethink many ways of their supply chain and needs to rethink how they're going to reach customers and how they're going to innovate internally to come up with the next uh, uh, big product that they want to come up with. Everything has changed in COVID. Go ahead, somebody jump in. Hear your experiences. Uh, let me take a slightly different tact, uh, just for the sake of conversation. Clearly, those points are well made. You know, the 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 kind of questions that I, I've been getting and the concerns that many CEOs that I have spoken with center as much with the tactical issues that you just mentioned, center around also how do I maintain and exhibit leadership to my organization during a period like this? And do I need to pivot? Do I need to change? You know, and again, I'm not talking about the tactical or the technical issues needed, whether you Zoom meeting or whether you're recruiting online and so on and so forth. It's, it was more about more about the individual and what they need to do to maintain their, their leadership. And I, I basically, you know, have about five different points that I like to um, present to them. And all of those five points are relevant before, during, and after a pandemic. So I focus on, you know, working with CEOs and heads of companies, whether they're small or large, and try to say that the, the pandemic is extraordinary, but you're, this is not an extraordinary you know, circumstances where you have to change your leadership style necessarily. It's important to drive the proposition that you've established, you know, and that's going to raise, you know, the bar for you. And I think you're going to get substantial buy-in and comfort, you know, uh, exhibited by your employees, you know, during a difficult period. I won't go into the five points, but I do think, you know, it's 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 all about being able to maintain, you know, your leadership ability at a difficult time. Yeah, I think I'd, I'd probably pick up on that from, from Ned. That for me, it is it is very centered on on leadership, and there are there are three themes that that I've been picking up over the last few months: um, resilience, agility, and cultural renewal. Um, so from my work in, in sport, I think the level of resilience that Olympic uh, athletes traditionally show in the pursuit of their goals is in a completely different league to what most business leaders typically have to deal with. But I think in the pandemic, um, leaders are having to find new levels of, of resilience. I mean, I'm working with leaders that are typically very positive, very enthusiastic, 
and they're waking up in the morning feeling as flat as a pancake and they don't understand what's happened to their motivation and to their mojo. And, and I think, you know, that's the measure of the resilience challenge that, that is being presented to a lot of these leaders. Uh, agility, I think, you know, the 12-month business plan has been ripped up. Um, what are you going to replace it with? Um, I think the agile way of working, the 12-week sprint, is, is coming to a lot more sectors than just the software development sector. Um, I think that agile way of working is, is going to um, penetrate much more into the, the mainstream of most sectors. And the cultural renewal piece, you know, we've, we've seen this year, you know, the Black Lives Matter um, challenge. We've seen societies decide that human life is more important than GDP. Um, we're, we're seeing cultural, um, a cultural sort of uprising, the likes of which we probably haven't seen for hundreds of years. So I do think we're going through something of a shift from the industrial age to the social age. And I think that is bringing with it some very deep cultural um, renewal opportunities. Um, But leaders really need to work hard to make sure that they're not part of the problem and they stay part of the solution. And it's very easy to make a, a misstep in that calculation at the moment and find yourself on the wrong side of the line between the past and the future. So uh, those are the three themes for me, resilience, agility, cultural renewal. Yeah, we've spent, in the board meetings, we've spent, in my discussions with the CEO, most of the time, because most of my board boards, they're already pretty technically savvy. So, you know, distributed workflow was not foreign to them. The bank was a little tougher because um, they're not quite quite as far ahead. But all of them, um, and particularly the bank, actually, is the, is the most focused on how do I maintain my connection with my employees? Um, how do managers manage when nobody's around? How do we educate our younger, more junior people when many times it was, you know, leaning over the their cubicle to somebody else to talk or easily be able to walk into their boss into their office and have a discussion. And those things are now much tougher. And so they're trying to understand how do I live in this Zoom world? But the world I come back to won't probably look the same, uh, whether I have staggered, you know, people, some people coming in three days a week, some people coming in two days a week. I'm going to have to deal with this. And how do I keep that connected tissue with my employees so they feel part of the organization I understand what they're feeling, what they're doing, and then how do we continue to drive big ideas? Because one thing I heard recently talking to you know somebody else in a larger company um, was that they're finding that small things are getting done, you know, pushing things along. They're finding it much more difficult to get large projects moving efficiently. As one person said, it seems to take two or three times longer for big things to get get moving. And, um, you know, I think it's a new experience for all of us. So let's uh, stick with that theme. I'd love to hear what it, what you guys are seeing. What's different? I, I mean, John talked about uh, the social age, and you talked about that so, sort of social connective tissue. And one of the things I'm hearing from a lot of leaders is now that their employees aren't there physically, they have no idea how to maintain the culture of their company and that social interaction. And they're trying to figure out brand new online ways uh, to basically socialize among other things. So there's an area of change. But let's talk about changes you've seen your your clients actually make, Uh, good or bad. What has actually changed? What are they now doing different and probably permanently than they were before? Let's talk about changes you've seen. Anybody jump in? I'll just give you a quick, a quick, quick example there, just to get the ball rolling. Um, so I have a client that um, it, it, it works at senior level in Unilever, and um, he was talking to me about the challenge of, uh, which, which I think has been mentioned, you know, of moving from managing a virtual meeting to leading a virtual team, uh, and that he, f- he felt very competent in managing a virtual meeting, but he doesn't feel competent in leading a virtual team. And one of the things he's introduced is, and it's a simple thing, you know, that, but just the virtual cup of coffee uh, but he, he has to schedule that in 
you know, whereas in the office it just sort of happened because it came with the infrastructure. He now has to get intentional about that and he has to schedule in the virtual cup of coffee. And then he has these virtual cup of coffees and he says to his uh, whoever the team member is, um, how are you doing? And the, the answer he said he got from the team member is, uh, yeah, I'm fine. What do you want? Uh, and he said, no, I'm just asking you how you're doing. And the answer was, yeah, I'm fine. But what do you want? Um, and, and it just demonstrates that we're still quite awkward with using this space for anything other than a very task focused conversation. But I think we will get better at that. And I think, you know, things like the virtual cup of coffee is leaders beginning to think that through and starting to design the space and use this space in a more um, in a more in more agile way. Um, so I just just throw that in as one one simple little thing. You know, um, can we can we uh, can we organize those virtual cup of, cups of coffee? One thing that uh, a word that comes up frequently in my exchanges, and I also think it's relevant during pandemic or not, you know, but I hear it a lot, and I think it's very important now, and that's just simplification. How do I simplify and deliver a message that is where I can simpl- I simplify the strategy, I simplify processes, I simplify, you know, the objectives and my expectations, you know, delivered to these employees so they can grasp easier through these difficult processes, Zoom meetings, and so on and so forth. So simplification, you know, uh, and seems to be, uh, phrase and seems to be a concept that a lot of people are buying into. And I think it's important to do so. I think of what we're finding out, though, when they're able to do that, they engender trust <clears throat> and confidence, you know, in themselves as leaders. If they sit there and they're able to simplify, by simplify, that doesn't mean it takes complex concepts and processes, delivers it in such a way that the team doesn't make any difference if it's Zoom or in the or in a live meeting. They, they they hear it, they see it, they get it, and they can do something with it. Maybe, you know, through Zoom and through pandemic periods, you have to be just better at that. And I think that's a very, very, very you know, we get we get tied up with complex data sets and in all these metrics from which we're measuring, but you know, a simple observation. And, and, and just simplification, you know, is very, very important management concept. And I think more important now than ever. I would agree with that. I spend a lot of my time working on simplifications and taking complex issues and making them readily understood. Uh, so I deal with some very difficult and complex issues around the world, and I have to make it understandable to people both from senior levels right down to individual levels. And Have I, there been, for all you guys, oh, I'm sorry, for those we finished, I didn't mean to. I was just going to say, I think what this discussion is pointing out is that the soft skills that one needs uh, as a, in, both as an employer as a, and as an employee are becoming more and more I- important. And the technical skills are becoming less important and that's going to be generally true uh, going forward. There's an annual survey done every year uh, of the world's largest platform, I don't want to name it, of uh, employers. And they have always asked, what is the skill that you're most looking for? And it's usually not a technical skill, especially nowadays. It's usually things like creativity and problem-solving ability. And I think those skills are going to become the drivers of uh, both employers and employees in the future. So if you were asking the executives right now, any of you, has COVID revealed a weakness or a missing skill? Has COVID caused executives to say, wow, I just realized I need to work on this particular skill more than I did before? What has this exposed to leaders uh, that they need more coaching on than they did before? Well, if I can jump in, to me, it's very simple, and that's the ability to rethink things. That's the ability to innovate. That's the ability, and it doesn't mean that you kind of change the world or you change your companies uh, completely, 
but it simply means that you have to adapt. And I like the word agility um, because that's really what's necessary is the, is the ability to think forward and to make changes. Nobody saw COVID coming. It was kind of imposed on us, uh, even though, of course, there have been many crises like the financial crisis and so on in the past. And, and companies have always had to adapt. But this is a different level of adaptation that's now necessary. Uh, and this is, this is almost unprecedented unless you, you know, go back to World War II or something where the whole world changed. So I do think that, uh, I do think that the ability to change and the ability to look for new opportunities, the ability to rethink the way your company operates, this, everything. Uh, from your supply chain to the way you market to customers has to change. And that ability uh, and the flexibility, agility, whatever you want to call it, that is going to become or is already in 2020 the most essential ingredient. Well, another thought I have, you know, again, I'm a more of a believer in this is a time and this is an opportunity for leadership to demonstrate that we all, I already, I, he or she already had in place core concepts about their leadership that, you know, were available and presented to the employees of a large corporation or wherever before the pandemic. But now, you know, if you demonstrate those same those same principles and those same values, it just validates you as a leader even better because of the difficult times. It's the same thing. You know, I, I, one word or another, I have five things that I like to table with them as ways of driving that proposition on a regular basis, right? All day long. But, you know, the whole idea of proaction is always better than reaction, right? We know that. Now, did these places have crisis management teams in place already? Crisis communications programs in, you know, in place already? Um, were they already, had they already established as leaders, you know, relationships with stakeholder groups, their board members, their shareholder groups, and or politicians or, you know, people, policymakers, all of these things now that they need to have a dialogue with so they can, do the next right thing for their organization. Did they have that in place already? You know, they should have had it in place already because you need to anticipate. You need to be proactive because things like this are going to happen. Yes, pandemic is extraordinary, but you may have an individual crisis in your sector or in or your company, and you need to be ready for that, right? And now, there was someone was mentioned about Black Lives Matter and all this other stuff. But in corporate America, you know, basically, you know, we've been dealing with these issues for the better part of 30 years. Yes, there's this cultural phenomena that, you know, because I sat on top of, you know, all of these social responsibility programs and all the things that are going on and something like that, you know, for years, for years, this stuff has been happening. The point there I want to make is that what you should be doing as a leader, as a corporation, you should be having, you should have that in place that you should be educating people and particularly these stakeholder groups that have emerged about the core, the core values of your organization and what you do matters. What you, it's not what you coming up with a billion dollars like these, I think these banks are making fundamental mistakes. By running out and saying, "Oh, oh, oh there's a Black Lives Matter, you know, the Lives Matter movement," so I'm going to put a billion dollars aside for loans to people of color. I mean, that's not a strategy. That's not that's not smart leadership per se. It's a tactic, but it's not smart leadership. And I think you know those who were thinking ahead and those who are, you know like you know believe that what they do as a company matters and they can have people understand that in advance of crisis are the ones who are going to end up with a sustainable relationship and they're not going to be in the newspapers. Yeah, I might um, 
add to that that um, one thing we've talked about is how do we bring everybody along? Because, yeah, you have COVID, Black Lives Matter, all these other, you know, social issues going on. And um, what we've talked about, and, and some of it is, is personal experience, because certainly at Silicon Valley Bank, we had been having diversity inclusion going back five years. And one thing that always struck me was when we were rolling out some of this diversity and inclusion was that I had a, one of my direct reports came to me, good guy. And he goes, you know, when you talk about the prevalent culture, you know, when we talk white frat boys or whatever, he goes, that doesn't apply to me at all. You know, I actually, I was spent part of my life in Russia. Um, I've been an immigrant and I don't identify with what the message I'm getting on this predominant white culture because I'm not part of it. And so I've tried to bring, and I think other people too, that same attitude of you just have to be careful of how you're um, messaging your troops to make sure everyone feels part of it. Everyone feels like their identity is taken um, seriously, that they just don't get lumped into a group because you may look at them and facially they look something um, um, and you may make assumptions about them. So we do talk a fair amount about that, about how do we do the education, but yet make sure everybody is moving along on the path rather than it's sort of an us and them uh, type of thing. All right, so we have uh, just our last five minutes here, so I'd like you each to kind of do your closing statement. Just take like a minute each and just your thoughts and or advice on the future of coaching as we go forward. Try to keep it to like 60 seconds each for dose. Sorry, I had to unmute. Um, the future of coaching is uh, very much tied into the future of what might happen on the macro level uh, right down to a company micro level. And I think that it's going to change. I think uh, it, it is already changing. I think that soft skills and the way we approach the world, I, I totally agree that companies have to get off uh, a simple profit motive and have to have much more understanding of the impact of, of uh, them, their company on the planet or on their community on the smaller level. And coaching is going to change, uh, just like uh, many other things are going to change. So it's going to become much more one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, it's not going to be uh, as uh, broad-based uh, as it was before. I see we only have one minute 53, so I'm going to stop. <laughs> yeah, very quickly. Um, you ain't seen nothing yet. Um, COVID is not a medical phenomenon. It's a social phenomenon. You know, we had Spanish flu in 1918. 80 million people died. Nobody batted an eyelid. GDP didn't miss a skip a beat. Um, so we're making decisions very differently now. We're, 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 we're into a different economic paradigm. And uh, boy, are we going to see some change. And uh, coaches, therefore, are going to be very, very busy because a lot of people are going to need a lot of help. Yeah, I think coaching is going to continue to be um, be here and become more impressive as you sit there on the, on the strategy side, make sure it works. But the ones that will differentiate and the companies will differentiate are the ones that can take the culture with it and the culture supports the strategy that drives performance. Thank you. And just in case the time runs out uh, here, Ned, I just want to thank all you guys very much for spending your time here today. But go ahead, Ned, bring us on. No, I do think, you know, I do agree that this whole pressure on, you know, on corporations about people and planet is going to continue. That will not end. Uh, but you better have a better response than what corporations have been doing to date. And coaching you know, so I would say that coaching is going to have a big opportunity as corporations need to understand, react better to the external environment as opposed to anything they are doing internally on a daily basis. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right that uh, coaching focused a lot more 
in the past on internal issues at the company. And then all of a sudden the whole world changed and coaches were saying, I don't know how to deal with the rest of the world now. Thank you, everybody. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank, Thank you, everyone. Take care. All right. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.